Hello, welcome back to another- Last episode, we made an everlasting friend and an eternal enemy. This episode, we take a deep dive into Zolfarak to uncover sacred artifacts, Godzilla copyright infringement, and party members suffering from Dunning-Kruger syndrome. This is the tale of the carrot on a stick. Our story begins in the Shimmering Flats, a desolate expanse devoid of vegetation and most other signs of life. In the Shimmering Flats, everything is white as far as the eye can see. There is round-the-clock NASCAR, and what little civilization exists is entirely dependent on fossil fuels. Whilst the average boomer sees this place as a vision of heaven, I f hate this zone. In fact, seeing it become submerged underwater during the Cataclysm trailer was, for me, the highlight of 2010. And I lost my virginity that year. But I digress. The Shimmering Flats is home to many goblin and gnome engineers who spend all day drinking white monster energy and racing in dangerous makeshift vehicles. Now this is pod racing. One of the gnomes, named Wizzle Brassbolts, has a level 50 quest which reads the following. Following. Deep in Zolfarak, the trans- the, the trans city? That's not- Deep in Zolfarak, the sand troll city in Tanaris, there is a sacred pool. From that pool, the trolls summon a huge beast, Gazrilla. He's so fierce, even- Wait, he's a gnome. He- <laughs> Sound like that. He's so fierce that even his scales crackle with energy. It's that energy I want to harness for my car. Bring me the electrified scale of Gazrilla. And in exchange for my trouble, he offers a highly sought after trinket, the carrot on a stick, which, as you know from last episode, increases mounted speed by 3%. Okay, seems simple enough, right? Just gotta go to a dungeon, kill a boss. You are wrong. Oh, my sweet viewers, I wish I could tell you it was going to be that easy, but mounted speed comes at a cost, and if you want it, you must be prepared to pay its price. Price. The task ahead was going to be gargantuan, and with my current level being way lower than is recommended, my chances of success were slim to none. But you know me, Iron Will, Ninja Way, whatever, fucking roll the next part of the video. Welcome to Lordaeron, the northern part of the Eastern Kingdoms. Three years ago, the denizens of this beautiful land lived in peace under the alliance of Lordaeron. The elves in the north were happy, the humans in the middle were happy, the dwarves to the south were happy, and the gnomes were gnomes. And then the prince became a death knight and killed everyone. With his mind-controlled army of the dead, Prince Arthas marched north towards the elven city of Quel'Thalas on a mission to seize the means of production of Sunny Delight. During the battle, a certain high elf named Sylvanas Please Don't Ruin My Character Windrunner told Arthas that the skulls on his armor look, quote, a bit gay. In response to this, Arthas tore her soul from her body and turned her into a banshee. Some would argue that this was a disproportionate reaction. After wiping out the population of Northern Lordaeron, Arthas' mind control would dwindle and he'd fuck off back to Northrend to cry about it. No longer mind controlled, all the undead who used to live in Lordaeron were like, oh, I guess we just go back to living here then? And so Lordaeron became home to the Forsaken, the no longer mind-controlled undead army led by Sylvanas Windrunner, and they're all super pissed at Arthas. Uh, I'm sure they will forgive and forget. Did you think we had forgotten? Did you think we had forgiven? Uh, never mind. But if we go back even further, Lordaeron was originally home to the forest trolls of the Armani Empire. For hundreds of years, the trolls did tr troll stuff. But then, the elves arrived, and they knew magic. Discovering that the trolls were susceptible to fire, the elves pushed them south and established Quel'Thalas, and the trolls were pissed. But then, the humans arrived, and the elves taught them magic. Discovering that the trolls were susceptible to fire, the humans pushed them east and established Lordaeron, and the trolls were pissed. Present day, the once great Armani Empire now looks like this, reduced solely to one area, the Hinterlands, and the trolls are pissed. But why did I just tell you all that? Well, remember this gnome who just so casually asked us to kill Gazrilla for electrified scales? Yeah, it turns out this Gazrilla is actually a demigod secret boss, and his summoning ritual requires you to be in possession of an enchanted mallet. How to obtain the enchanted mallet, you ask? Well, luckily for me, this troll left an ancient tablet in their will, and it details how to obtain it. To create the mallet of Zolfarak, one must first travel to the altar of Zul and obtain the sacred mallet from a troll keeper. Next, one must bring the sacred mallet to the altar atop the troll city of Jintha Alor. Using the sacred mallet at the altar will infuse it with power and transform it into the mallet of Zolfarak. Okay, seems simple enough, right? Just gotta go ask the troll keeper for the mallet, then I go bl- You are wrong! The troll keeper in question lives in the Hinterlands. The troll keeper in question is part of the aforementioned Amani tribe. The troll keeper in question 
is pissed. Now I could spend the next couple years of my life working as an envoy for the Horde, easing tensions and improving relations with the Armani tribe, earning their trust over several years and then eventually cashing in my socio-political clout points for a sacred mallet. But I don't have time for that. I just want to make Mount go fast. And so I set off for the Hinterlands on a mission to obtain the Mallet of Zulfarak, the item required to summon Gazrilla. Following the directions of the tablet, I made for the Altar of Zul, where the Mallet's Keeper would await me. Upon arriving, I find that the Mallet's Keeper, whose name can fuck off, is a level 50 elite mob. Oh, that's not good. And being a level 43 reanimated pile of bones, I begin to have second thoughts. Oh no, she's level 50! Now you guys know me, the last thing I am is a quitter. I, I always stick it through to the end and I don't quit, but uh, I'm gonna quit. But just as I turned to leave, I looked up and saw a familiar face, a mage by the name of Merrills, who just yesterday I had a whole adventure with, the footage for which is unfortunately lost forever due to Windows patented shutting down your computer right now, fuck you technology. Now Merrills wasn't here for the same reason I was, but that didn't stop them from being a total bro and helping me anyway. Together with this random warrior, we managed to take down fuck off and obtain the sacred mallet. Now we just had to bless it. The intended way of doing this is to battle your way through the troll city of Jintha Alor, a city littered with elite mobs that increase in level as you ascend, eventually culminating in a grand battle with the leader of the tribe, Vile Priestess Hex, who is blocking your access to the altar required to bless the sacred mallet. However, my teammates opted for the high IQ play of running in, dying, walking back to your corpse and repeating until you reach the summit. Being the insecure rogue player that I am, I simply stealthed my way to the top. God, I fucking love being a rogue. Once there, we waited for the priestess to turn her back, then Meryl turned the watchman into a sheep and we scrambled to bless the mallet before the priestess turned back around. Now with the mallet of Zulfarak in my possession, I was ready to find a group and start my dungeon experience. Because I had the Mallet of Zulfarak, finding a group was incredibly easy. Now this might be largely unimpressive by the time the video releases, but having the Mallet at such a low level was a huge deal during the first week of the game. At the time of recording, level 43 was already incredibly ahead of the curve, so to have an item that was intended for level 50s and above pretty much made me royalty. Having the Mallet assured that everyone in the group would obtain their mounted speed trinket, and I was therefore sure this dungeon would be a happy, fun, great time enjoyed by all. I mean, we're just five incredibly ahead of the curve World of Warcraft addicts, there's no way we're not mentally stable. Surely we will get through this dungeon just fine. Me and the tank met up with the Warlock just outside the dungeon, and after summoning the other DPS and the Warlock's healer girlfriend, we rode into Zolfarak and started our assault. Going against the norm, the very first pull of the dungeon was not made by the tank, but instead the Warlock. After we down the first pack, the tank respectfully asks the Warlock to allow him to obtain aggro first, to which the Warlock responds, It was a non-damaging Curse. Which is just, you're still aggroing the mob, but okay. The tank then pulls the second pack, and for some reason, whilst we're still fighting it, the warlock pulls the third. Despite the overwhelming numbers, we emerge victorious, and I'm feeling optimistic about the rest of the dungeon. If we can overcome a pull like that, this dungeon should be no sweat. The warlock's gamer girlfriend then says, With no CC and no tank, this will be long and painful. And I just... What? It is at this point the tank asks the question on everyone's mind. You guys know? The warlock then despawns his DPS pet and summons his tank pet, confirming what we all suspected. But that's okay, new players are players too, and I'm sure this warlock will learn as the dungeon progresses that the tank should be the one to pull mobs. The healer then chastises the tank for two-hand tanking, which is literally not a problem, especially not at this level. Further cementing in our heads that these two partners in crime are the worst type of moron. A moron who speaks with conviction on a subject they very clearly know nothing about. The next pull goes smoothly as the tank was able to get aggro before the warlock. Shocking how that works. But the two warriors were very clearly still feeling the effects of the priest's last moronic idiot statement. To combat the plummeting morale at the hands of these two retards, I attempt to bolster the troops. We are doing fine and will continue to do fine. The healer then immediately complains about going out of mana in the previous fight. You know, the one that was so tough because her boyfriend pulled the entire pack. Next, the tank tells us to follow as we are going to walk in a specific way to skip a couple of mobs. To my dismay, the warlock had not mastered the ancient art of desummoning your pet, and so everything was pulled anyway. Thank you, Voidwalker. Fortunately, we make short work of them, and the tank asks that the warlock put his pet on passive during shortcuts to avoid such blunders in the future. The warlock then tries to use what I said earlier about letting people play how they want, I was referring to the tank, as an argument to be made why he should be allowed to keep ninja pulling mobs. Further ahead, by some grace of God, 
god, we actually managed to conquer the first boss. Further ahead still, we come to the second boss, who spawns when you get too close to his cave. The warrior warns the warlock in advance, but alas, too late. At least his Voidwalker was there to tank it briefly, am I right? The boss fight begins, and let me tell you, this boss is a real piece of shit. He constantly summons these basilisks, which by design have too much health to warrant focusing, so the fight just becomes a race to nuke the main guy before you all perish miserably. It is nothing short of a miracle that we pulled through, but with the hardest boss encounter complete and with no casualties to boot, I was confident that we could take this run to the end. We proceed to the third boss where everything goes fine. Well, I mean, the warlock did commit suicide with Hellfire, but everything went fine. As we clear the way to the next boss fight, the tank politely reiterates for the party, read warlock, to please let him make the pulls and to not attack unless he's in the fight. Pretty reasonable, right? Just don't tell other people how to play. The other warrior chimes in for the first time to say he's new and the tips the tank is giving are actually helping him learn. And of course, the warlock has a problem with this too, stating that the tank was displaying lame as fuck behavior. No, I'm preventing wipes. No. You aren't. We pull the fourth boss and I try to raise morale once again. Let's just all have fun, smiley face. But when the warlock immediately resumes crying after the fight, the polite tank's patience had come to an end. Without a further word, he posts the damage meters in chat for the last fight, revealing that not only is Baus the warlock doing the least amount of damage out of the damage dealers, he's also being out damaged by the tank and the healer. In fact, his pocket healer girlfriend is doing more than double his damage. Now I'm no therapist, but I suspect being presented with the irrefutable evidence that he was fucking useless shattered through his Dunning-Kruger syndrome and induced a psychosis. I really don't care what you think, kid. Can we kick the lock? He isn't even doing damage. Crying face? Stop! Bounce the warlock then left the party and took his healer girlfriend with him. Later dipshit. Bounce projects onto the tank and tells him to eat a bag of dicks before being ejected from the instance. With a complete lack of self-awareness, he then starts whispering me all this bullshit about how the tank was toxic and I tell him to take a breather. He tells me he's going to be just fine and I totally believe him. The last 30 minutes had been nothing short of a true test of patience, but with the end of the dungeon quite literally in view, we weren't going to give up now. We replenished our group and marched onwards to what could only be certain victory. That carrot on a stick is so close, I can taste it. After surviving the pyramid- <coughs> After surviving the pyramid gauntlet, where waves after waves of trolls attempt to murder you, we clear the fifth boss encounter, which is actually the group of people we just rescued from captivity. Not a good day for these guys. I also remind the group that I have the Mallet of Zolfarak, which I must not have mentioned before because the warrior acts accordingly. With a positive spring in our step, we headed to the final encounter, and it was here that it became obvious just how much of a clown fiesta we had been putting up with before. Where Baus was a bumbling, ignorant moron, Blood Eye was a cold, calculated killer. He also didn't have his tank pet out, so uh, good job, Blood Eye. The final boss fell, and it was time to move forward to the true goal. Garzrilla. For an hour, I had suffered through an agonizing dungeon experience at the hands of two idiots, but I was finally about to reap the rewards of my patience. Except not really at all, because we accidentally pulled one too many mobs on the way and wiped, and then Blood Eye immediately quit. Good job, Blood Eye. The party subsequently fell apart, and I was left carrotless and heartbroken. I'd like to tell you it gets better from here, but we really are just getting started. Fifteen minutes later, I find myself invited to another group. Having the mallet of Zolfarak truly makes you feel like the only dude at the party with weed. We make it to the cave and once again someone accidentally triggers the boss fight. We wipe. No problem though, everyone actually seems competent this time and it is an easy mistake to make. After explaining how the trigger zone works, we attempt the fight again but unfortunately eat shit because the party leader was focusing the ads instead of nuking the boss as you're meant to. We wipe again, the healer leaves, and I am removed for having a quote, bad attitude. I don't know what I did to trigger this man's inferiority complex, but I can only deduce that he was threatened by my Chad aura. What can I say? Being an alpha peak male specimen really is a curse. 20 minutes later, I get into another group. Having Mallet of Zulfarang, you know the drill. Fast forward to the cave, same shit, different group. Boss gets pulled, we actually come out on top and an agility ring drops, which is a nice upgrade for me, but then the healer needs on it and wins. When confronted, he went on an insane tangent, accusing me of conspiring to sell the ring instead of using it, and so he took it to prevent such an injustice. Wow, what a hero. Even after checking my gear and seeing that it was indeed an upgrade, he stands by his ignorant, objectively wrong 
statement, trying to coax the rest of the team onto his side. Thankfully for me, the rest of the party are sane, stable people, and they do not concede to his bullshit. They tell him to give me the ring, and after he does, he pulls a bunch of mobs, wipes the party, and leaves. If you're starting to see a correlation between being ahead of the curve and being a crybaby loser, I applaud your perception. Another 20 minutes pass. We refill our ranks, reset the instance, and try again. Five minutes in, our warlock gets stuck in a wall, his pet pulls everything, and we fucking die. I close my eyes, take a deep breath, and pray to whatever god will hear me. Please, please just give me one good group. I just want my carrot. Please, I just want to go fast. We return to the instance, and suddenly everything starts running smoothly. We take down packs with no problem, the first boss falls, and we're on track to make it to the second boss in record time. The tank then leaves the the party and Hearthstone's out. Oh! I call in an emergency favor from a guildmate. We summon him and head into Zulfarak for what I can only hope is the last time. We fight our way to the cave and to my surprise nobody aggros the boss. In fact, Everyone knows what the hell is going on. Towards the end of the fight, our healer succumbs to the swarming mass of basilisks, and I know it's only a short amount of time before we inevitably wipe. I last hit the boss and vanish the hell out of there as everyone around me dies screaming. God, I fucking love being a rogue. With the hardest encounter down, we breeze through the rest of the dungeon and approach the sacred pool. Would this be it? After suffering through five hours of quitters, blamers, and insecure warlocks, would I finally face off against Garzrilla? We get ready to pull the final pack and the tank says he has to go. Ah! Just kidding. We steamroll the pack and I walk up to the gong, strike it with my mallet of Zulfarak, and finally we summon Garzrilla. Slowly he emerges from the pool before entering into a full sprint, charging into us and knocking us airborne. Holy shit, this is a real fight. Holy shit, he's so tanky. After being knocked airborne again, I use this downtime to ingest a tasty beverage. Mmm, G Fuel, 10% off with code Barney. Garzrilla puts me in a block of ice for 10 seconds, and after emerging from my icy tomb, I make the Final incision. Garzrilla is defeated. I did it! And that, my friends, is the tale of the carrot on a stick. And hey, if you like my videos, consider supporting me on my brand new Patreon. Wow! Patreon! Wow! More WoW classic videos to come. Please like and subscribe. Okay, bye.